Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In today's video, I want to take the Boole Mobius transform and sort of put it into a larger context, connecting it with the combinatorial theory of partially ordered sets, explaining the connection with the Mobius function, and just suggesting further directions uh, to, to generalize what we've been talking about um, in the context of Maxwell theory, which is my preferred framework for linear algebra. So today's lecture is a little bit more advanced. It's probably the most advanced talk in this little series on Boole's logic. And, uh, and, and some of it is a little bit um, you know, pointing towards further directions. I'm not going to be that uh, explicit and, uh, and comprehensive. Okay, so I want to introduce the idea of a partially ordered set rather informally. So let's have a look at some, some examples starting with this divisibility uh, partially ordered set. So let's think about the divisors of 24. The natural numbers that divide 24. They are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. And here they are partially ordered by divisibility. So in other words, we look at when one of these divisors divides another. So 3 divides 6. And so 3 goes lower in this pecking order that's described by this diagram. Sometimes called a Hasse diagram for the partially ordered set. Now, we're interested in a particular transformation, which is a generalization of the Boole-Mobius transform. And so we could take this partially ordered set and sort of copy it over here and think about a function on the, the actual elements or the vertices of this graph. So let's consider a function, say f, which has values 1, 0, 2, 3, minus 1, 4, 1, and 5. And I'm interested in taking that function and transforming it to another function, which we'll call ft. So we're applying the transformation operator t on the, on the right. So how do we get this function from this one? Well, informally, the rule is that the value at any node is the sum of all the values in the original graph at all the nodes which are less than or equal to the given node. So if we're interested in the value here, we would look at the corresponding values of the function here and also at these uh, other vertices which are less than this one or less than or equal to this one in the partial order. So we would have to sum 1 plus 3 plus minus 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 1 and that's how we get 6. For example here, this value here is obtained, the 3 is obtained by 2 plus 1. The 15 is the sum of all of them. Here is the general formula that describes this transform. That ft of v, v is a, a vertex, is a sum over all z which are less than or equal to v, where the less than or equal to represents the partial order that we're considering. And then we sum f of z. So this is a very natural transform. It's very important in combinatorics. And a kind of fundamental question is, how do we recover f from ft? If we know this thing, how do we recover the original function? Now, to help us organize that kind of question, it's useful to label the vertices in a consistent way that is consistent with the partial order. So here was the original partial order set with the actual numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, 24. These are the divisors of 24. But when we're working with this situation, it's perhaps better to relabel them. So let's refer to them rather as uh, the vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that the values of the original function that we're considering might be called x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, and x8. And the resulting function after we do that t transform to get ft is the new function with values y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, y6, y7, y8. So now we have everything nicely organized, indexed by the numbers from 1 to 8. And so we can ask, okay, how do we get this vector y1 through y8 
from the original vector x1 through x8. Well, we know what the procedure is. We know that we have to sum various things below everything. And here is the matrix that we need to multiply this vector by in order to get the y vector. So, for example, if we're, say, interested in, um, in uh, y7, how do we get y7? Well, that would correspond to this column right here. And that would be telling us that we need to take um, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5, uh, not x6, but also plus x7 and not x8. So that's how we get the y7 term as a linear combination of the x's given by that first column. So each one of these columns corresponds to another uh, vertex in the output. So in particular, now we've touched base with linear algebra. Our transform is then given by multiplication by this 8 by 8 matrix. So this is very similar to the kind of thing that we were looking at with the Boole-Mobius transform. And we can see that it's the same kind of question, but in fact we could sort of ask this kind of question for a general partially ordered set. So it's a way of generalizing or putting what we're doing into a bigger context. Okay, so sticking with this divisors of 24 example, here is the matrix for T again, which represents this operation of taking the sum of all the function values which are less than or equal to a given node in the partial order. Okay, let's call this matrix T. That's the one we've just been considering. And here are the natural labels, this time with the original labels, the numbers from 1 to 24, which are divisors of 24. Because I want to uh, explain the relationship between this matrix T and its inverse. So if we want to solve X in terms of Y, we have to multiply by the inverse of this matrix. We have to find the inverse of this matrix. And here it is right here. It's also an upper triangular matrix like this one with ones on the diagonal. But now there's zeros, ones, and minus ones in this top portion and it's perhaps not entirely clear uh, what the pattern is. So the formula for T is very direct. That's just the formula for the divisibility condition. And if we're indexing things by the actual factors or divisors of 24, then Tij is 1 if i divides j and 0 otherwise. So for example, this 1 here is a 1 because 4 divides 12. This is a zero because four does not divide six. So the formula for this one is quite simple. The formula for the inverse matrix, however, is quite a lot more subtle. And this is actually where the original Mobius function came into being, although it was not framed in this linear algebraic fashion, but it's equivalent. So the formula is that the ijth entry of this inverse matrix depends on the ratio j over i. Okay, so we're assuming that i divides j, so we're in this, this region here where there's possible ones, and now I'm telling you what the entry here is. It's some function of j and i. And what is this function of j over i? Well, it's either 1, minus 1, or 0. In fact, it's minus 1 to the s if j over i is a product of s distinct primes and zero otherwise. So we get a 1 or minus 1 if this ratio j over i is a product of distinct primes. In other words, has no squared or cubed or higher power prime factors. And in that case, we either get 1 or minus 1 depending on whether there's an even or an odd number of distinct primes. So for example, let's have a look at this minus 1. Okay, So that's in the 6, 12 entry. 12 over 6 is 2. 2 has a single prime factor. So there's only one of them. So we get minus 1 to the 1. So that's why there's a minus 1 there. How about uh, this one here, this 0? That's 3 and 12. So 12 over 3 is 4, but 4 is 2 squared. So it has a, a prime factor squared. So the value is 0. And let's say this one here. 
4, 24. 24 divided by 4 is 6, which is 2 times 3. So there are two distinct prime factors. We get minus 1 squared. That's why we get a 1 there. So this is where the term Mobius function comes from. Okay? It's a number theoretical function which we can think of as describing how to get the inverse matrix to this one. So this matrix captures the partially ordered set structure of the divisors of 24. And this matrix is capturing exactly the inverse of that matrix. And so the Mobius function is the key, uh, the key element here in order to describe efficiently what the entries of this inverse matrix are. So I've been talking about partial orders and partial ordered sets. I better make sure that we all know what that means. So what is a partial order? Well, if we restrict ourselves to partial orders on natural numbers or, or subsets of them, and maybe it's a little bit simpler to imagine. So we have a set, and you can think of it as being a set of natural numbers. And a partial order is a relation, typically denoted something like a less than or equal to, but this is kind of a curly less than or equal to to distinguish it from the usual one. So it's a relation between any two uh, elements in the set, which has three basic properties. Namely, any element A is less than or equal to A. The reflexive property. The anti-symmetric property. That if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to A, the only way that can happen is if A and B are the same. And the transitive property, if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. So the simplest example of a partial order is to just use the usual less than or equal relation given by the usual uh, sign like this. 0 is less than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 2, less than or equal to 3, etc. This is a linear order because they're all exactly in sequence. It's almost a kind of a trivial kind of partial order, but still an example of a partial order. Another example of a partial order is the divisibility condition, which we've already talked about in the context of divisors of 24. But actually, you could talk about divisors uh, generally on the natural number. So the relation is just that A is dividing B, well, or A divides B, the usual notion of divides. That is a partial order relation. And the one that's actually most pertinent for our discussion is the third standard example, which is the relation of inclusion on sets. Typically, all the subsets of a given set. So in other words, we look at the power set of a given set, say S. Now, to be specific, simple example, suppose S is the set A0, A1, A2. So there are then eight subsets. And then the relation, represented like this, is that A is a subset of B. And then here is the diagram that represents that relation with the empty set at the bottom, the total set at the top, and over here we see the three singleton sets and the three sets with two elements. And these bonds represent when we have inclusions. Now, we've seen that sometimes it's nicer to encode this a little bit more efficiently, connecting with binary things, by recording whether each one of these three uh, elements is included or not. And to do that, we actually prefer to think of the order as being with A0 on the right and A2 on the left. So that then 0, 0, 1 would represent the set A0. A0 is included, but A1 and A2 are not. So then we can rewrite this diagram, and now it looks like this, with these triples of zeros and ones representing the subsets, from the empty set up to the full set. Now, as we've seen, we're able to take that previous diagram and strip away the unnecessary zeros to the left of certain of the numbers, and then we just get the binary numbers from 0 to 7 in that same diagram. So if we want to, we can think about the elements here as just the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that's nice. So we have a kind of natural ordering or labeling of the elements of our post set. 
And so in some sense, we can just think about this as occurring in natural numbers. We started with sets contained in a given set. Now we've converted it into a partially ordered set of just numbers, which makes it more convenient to express things using linear algebra notation because we have an ordering of the elements that we can use. And now it turns out that this inclusion partial order actually can extend to natural numbers. So we could draw this picture in a bigger way um, by adding more variables to our original set A0, A1, A2. So if we added an A4, then that would allow us to extend this diagram going not just from 0 to 7, but from 0 out to 15. You might like to think about what that bigger picture would look like. And so you have these different partial orders that all sort of fit together. So actually, there's actually sort of a single partial order on all of the natural numbers that encodes all of them at the same time. Okay, so now I want to look specifically at what the inverse of the transformation T is. Uh, in this example where we have subsets of a three element set, this corresponds to our Boole Mobius transform uh, for three inputs, where we're working over the integers rather than over the mod 2 thing. So um, let's have a look at a very interesting um, new notation will arise as well. So here I'm copying that uh, relation. This is the relation T uh, that's represented by the partial order of inclusion on the sets of a three element set. And so just to remind you, here are the uh, representations of those subsets more or less the numbers from 0 to 7 in binary, but written as triples, both describing the rows and the columns. And the ijth entry of this thing is given by inclusion. It's 1 if i is a subset of j and 0 otherwise. So for example, this 1 here is a 1 because the entry here is 1, 0, 0, and the entry here is 1, 1, 0. So how can we tell whether this subset is a subset of this subset? Well, it's actually very simple, because in order for this to be a subset of this one, it is necessary and sufficient that all of the entries here be bigger than or equal to all of the entries here. So if anything is included here, say A2 in this case, then it has to be included here as well. And this thing here, why is that not a 1? Well, here there's 0, 1, 1. Is 0, 1, 1 a subset of 1, 1, 0? No, it's not. And we can see that because the 1 entry here on the right is not less than or equal to the 0 entry here on the right. So this is not a subset of that. That's why there's a 0 here. So the matrix T, which is really the Boole Mobius transform that we're, we're talking about, uh, has this 8 by 8 matrix form that we've already had a look at. And now I'm going to tell you what the inverse is over the integers. So if you just think of this as a, as a, a matrix with integer entries or rational number entries and ask your computer to find its inverse, here is the inverse, but I'm writing it in a rather novel way. I'm introducing this new notation for a negative sign. New notation for a negative sign. I, I'm not a fan of minus 1 or minus 3 as representing a negative number. I know we're all used to that, but if you think rationally about it, it's really not a very good notation because then there's confusion between the negative sign as an operation and as part of a number. This causes young people in primary school a lot of confusion. And I'm going to be talking about this important issue in my Elementary Mathematics Explained lectures. Okay? So it is a bold proposition, the idea that maybe we should introduce a more rational notation for negative signs. But in fact, accountants already do this. They have things in brackets or maybe in, in red or something like this. But uh, mathematically, this is uh, quite nice because then it can occupy more or less the same space. If you have to write this out with minus signs, then everything becomes a little bit uh, 
hard to write down because things are no longer aligned so nicely. But here, we're basically just taking this matrix, copying it, and then judiciously putting bars over certain elements. So it's a beautiful fact that this inverse matrix is the same as this one with some additional minus signs thrown in. Minus signs being represented by the bars. And what's the pattern with these minus signs? Which ones get minus signs and which ones don't? Well, here's the formula, which is the Mobius function in this context. So it turns out there's Mobius functions for any partially ordered set. Okay, the original Mobius function was for the divisibility partial order that I just showed you. This is sort of the second example. And here is the formula that T inverse ij is mu of ij. And it is either 1 or minus 1 or 0. It's minus 1 to the number of elements in j minus number of elements in i, if i is a subset of j, and 0 otherwise. So, for example, 1, 0, 0. Let's look at this entry here. 1, 0, 0 here and 1, 1, 0. This thing has one entry as a set, has one entry. This one has two entries. The difference between two and one is one. So we should have a minus one to the one, which is minus one. There's a zero here because this thing is not a subset of that. Okay, what about here? We have zero, one, zero, and one, one, one. This is a subset of that, so we have a one, but do we have a minus sign or not? Here there's a total size of one, here there's a total size of 3, the difference is 2, minus 1 squared is 1, that's why there's a 1 here. So once you see this formula, you see immediately why the Boole-Mobius transform, when we restrict to mod 2, is, as I claimed in the last lecture, exactly equal to the original matrix. Because if we restrict ourselves to a mod 2 formulation, then this thing is always equal to 1. And the formula for t inverse is exactly the same as the formula for t. It's 1 if i is a subset of j and 0 otherwise. Because mod 2 minus 1 is the same as 1. And it's supposed to be consistent. I really shouldn't put minus 1 here. I should put 1 bar. Let's do that. It takes a little while to shift your mental gears, but okay. One bar, there, we've written minus one in a novel fashion. Okay, so that's a, a nice story, and that general formula here, the formula for the Mobius function here, also works with more than three variables. So this is a very general formula and shows that even with larger number of variables, the Boole Mobius transform and its inverse are going to be, once you reduce mod 2, going to be given by the same matrices. The same matrices. That's not what happened in the uh, divisors of 24 case. Okay? It's a special thing that's happening here with this, uh, this partially ordered set consisting of subsets of a set. That's just what we need for the Boole Mobius transform to have this beautiful symmetry between it and its inverse. Now to finish uh, this, I want to just go a little bit briefly in a more advanced direction where I talk about you know, how this circle of ideas might extend to more general partially ordered sets. Okay, so it turns out that the basic framework that we've been talking about has nice generalizations and uh, partially ordered sets are very interesting and rich objects. So this is a very powerful and pleasant uh, generalization. And I want to advocate that probably the most optimal way of thinking about this, sometimes it's called incidence algebras of partial ordered sets in the combinatorics literature, I think the optimal way is to employ the Maxwell approach to linear algebra that I framed in earlier videos in the Math Foundation series. That turns out to be optimally suited for understanding what's going on here in a very direct and conceptual combinatorial way. So I'm going to very quickly just sort of go over that. It's not meant to be uh, 
comprehensive. So you can have a look at the Math Foundation series 166 to 172 that talks about maxils and vexils there. And I'm just going to illustrate things with a, a simple example of a partially ordered set which is not of the kind that we've been talking about. So have a look at this little partially ordered set. It's got five elements. One, two, three, four, five. We've labeled them in a nice way. And here are the relations. So uh, three is bigger than or equal to one. 4 is bigger than or equal to 1, 5 is bigger than or equal to 4, there's no relation between 2 and 5, etc. So that's a post set. Let's call it P, and let's refer to the partial order with the curly kind of uh, less than or equal to. Now, associated to that, we can think about a set of pixels. Okay, what's a pixel? A pixel is an ordered pair of, well, natural numbers, say i, j, where i, j are in the post set, so they're numbers from 1 to 5 in this case. And we're restricting ourselves to the pixels which have the property that i is less than or equal to j. What do those pixels look like? Well, here's the way we like to think about pixels. It's some kind of diagram. Uh, the labels here, so this would be the pixel uh, 3, 5. This would be the pixel 4, 4, etc. So 3, 5 is in the set because 3 is less than or equal to 5. And here are the various pixels that belong to the pix p for this p. Now, the whole framework of linear algebra and matrices can be kind of revamped into Maxwell language by introducing this product of pixels that the pixel ij times the pixel kl is either the pixel il in the case when j equals k or is uh, empty otherwise empty. You don't get anything. Okay, so uh, that turns uh, multi-sets of pixels into things which we call maxils. So a maxil is a multi-set of pixels. And then we can define max of p to be those maxils with support in pix of p. So the maxils that have entries just in these red boxes, they form a nice closed little algebra. So because of the beautiful property that this set is closed under the product. That's exactly the uh, consequence of the partially ordered set. If i is less than or equal to j, and j equals k, and k is less than or equal to l, then i will be less than or equal to l. It's a transitive property. So we get a nice little algebra of, of pixels max of p, and here is a very special element in that, in that algebra. It's the maxil that has a 1 in each one of these spots. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. We might call that the zeta maxil of the partially ordered set. That's in correspondence with terminology that the combinatorialists use. And a natural question is, what is the inverse of this matrix or maxil in the maxil world? Well, here it is. There's the inverse. And I've taken the liberty of using bars instead of minus ones. And we might call this the Mobius maxil. So the Mobius maxil is the inverse of the zeta maxil. And in this case, it turns out to have a one here. And then there's uh, one bars there, also one bar there and there. And otherwise, it has the same form. It's still one or non-zero, let's say, in the same places where this one is non-zero. Okay, so as I pointed out, then the maxils of our partial ordered set, that forms an algebra. In other words, not just closed under addition, scalar multiplication, but crucially under multiplication. So it's a nice closed little algebra. And here's a, a little fact that if m is a maxil in this maxil algebra associated to the partial order set P, and it happens to be invertible, okay, in the, the world of matrices, you can think of having a 5 by 5 matrix which is invertible, then the inverse is actually also in max of P. And okay, you have to say more about what we mean here, so we're really sort of imagining that we're extending the, um, the algebra to say have rational coefficients, uh, that might be a natural way to sort of frame it uh, in more in keeping with the usual linear algebra. 
Another nice property or feature of the Maxwell theory is that it allows us to extend, okay, to, to break the usual bonds of matrices where you're just dealing with matrices of a fixed size and the matrices of a certain size don't interact very well with matrices of bigger sizes. So with Maxwell theory we transcend all of that and we get to do arithmetic uh, smoothly and coherently across the entire spectrum of, of matrices. So a very powerful distinction. So anyway, the unbounded aspect of Maxwell theory allows extension to unbounded variables. So for example, instead of having three original variables a0, a1, a2 to build up our Boole Mobius transform, you know, that, that sort of 8 by 8 matrix, we could, we could actually have more variables. We could have four variables, we could have five variables, and in fact, we could think about having an unbounded number of variables. We just imagine these variables going on beyond our view, perhaps up to some limit that we cannot see. We don't have to make any big pronouncements about what happens to it um, beyond where we can see, but we can sort of just imagine it going, uh, going on. And then we can have a mathematics that consistently deals with not just these finite, but these unbounded kind of situations. So in other words, we're including the whole story pretty well at the same time. So we end up getting things like this, um, where we think of the, uh, the, the matrices that we've been thinking about so far as being just sort of initial top left segments of a pattern that just extends. Okay, so there is the 4x4 four four matrix that we've talked about. You make uh, four copies of something like that with a zero down here. Then you get the 8x8 eight eight, uh, version that actually appeared for us. Here's the 2x2, two two, here's the 1x1. One one. And the whole thing is, is part of a, a bigger sequence that just keeps on going. So this is like an on maxel, a maxel that's ongoing. Okay, so these are some of the advantages in thinking about things from the Maxwell point of view. There's much more to say about this, and on some other occasion I'll go into a lot more detail. Okay, so this is just for those electrical engineers, computer scientists who do have a mathematical aspect. You might be interested in the, the more theoretical connections with this Boole Mobius transform that we're using here. Okay, so I want, to, I want to just emphasize that this is actually a, a very natural kind of uh, thing that we're doing that connects with lots of other things. It's not just some special one-off uh, situation. Okay, so great. We've had now a lot of experience with the algebra of Boole in terms of enlarging our understanding of what's going on with logic gates circuit analysis. Now I want to shift to something actually closer in the original direction of Boole's thinking, which was the application of this algebra to propositional logic. Going back to Aristotle and the Stoics and the medieval and Arabic Islamic logicians. Okay, So we want to be able to apply this algebra to actually reconfigure courses in propositional logic, typically philosophy courses. And we're going to see that that's also of interest to electrical engineers and to computer scientists. So that discussion will not be separated from the discussion about logic gates, but will rather feed back and give us more insights and more tools for logic gate analysis. So it'll be very interesting. I hope you'll join me for that next time. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.